is Patrick McCarthy, who is president and CEO of the Annie Casey Foundation, who is your keynote speaker. Now, I should right away reveal uh, my deep level of bias here, because I consider Patrick a dear friend and a great co-conspirator in a number of things that we've been able to do together over the years uh, in and for the city. But uh, one never lose sight of the fact that at core, Patrick is a social worker uh, who is deeply devoted uh, to juvenile issues, to uh, the welfare of children. It's reflected in his experience in psychiatric social work, the juvenile correction system, and uh, as a division director in the Delaware, Delaware Department of Services for Children, Youth, and Their Families. And in all of these capacities, it has made him remarkably well-equipped uh, to bring uh, leadership to one of the premier, if not the premier, uh, nonprofits advocating for the welfare of children, families, and communities. Um, since joining Casey in 1994 to lead its mental uh, health initiative for urban children, uh, Patrick has demonstrated an extraordinary capacity to build programs around evidence-based solutions, sustain coalitions that help bring best, best practices into the field, and to communicate as well to politicians and policymakers as he does to parents. Uh, but knowing Patrick as well as I do, um, there is another uh, qualification that has made him an invaluable advocate for our most vulnerable uh, populations, and that is that he is a devoted father of four. And I've seen this firsthand in my many interactions with Patrick and his wife Kate over the years. As uh, a leader, he holds himself out to a very simple standard as he has framed it, if something's not good for his kids, why would it be good for someone else's? It's something that um, he brings regularly to his leadership of Casey, but I've seen this firsthand in the many interactions we've had discussing the East Baltimore Development Initiative, where we've been thinking about the Henderson Hopkins School and early childhood education and parks and other services, social services for uh, families uh, in that community. Uh, he is just unrelenting in his uh, pursuit of that ideal. And uh, on top of all of that, he just brings an incredible humility to all of these undertakings where for Patrick, what really matters is getting the job done, not getting any particular credit uh, for it. So with that, um, Patrick, it's just great to see you here at Hopkins and thank you for being our keynote speaker today. <laughs> So thank you, Ron. That was incredibly uh, generous. Uh, I recommend if anybody is going to be introduced, find one of your close friends. Um, they'll lie again and again and again to your benefit. So. so before I learned about the work of the Moore Center, almost everything I thought I knew about child sexual abuse was wrong. Now. My own personal ignorance on a depressingly wide range of topics is generally not cause for concern or even uh, comment. But as Ron briefly summarized, I've been a marriage and family therapist. I've run social service organizations. I've taught in schools, graduate schools of uh, social work. I've been a policymaker and a public sector administrator with responsibility for a juvenile justice system. I worked in philanthropy for 25 years, and I'm now the CEO of the largest foundation in the country that focuses on kids. So while I might be patient with my own general ignorance about lots of things, my specific ignorance about child sexual abuse was neither excusable nor inconsequential, because I'm fairly certain that my lack of understanding, and worse, my false beliefs led me to make many bad decisions that affected lots of people. And my lack of understanding and false beliefs led me to fail to take actions that could have made lives better, that could have helped lots of children have a better shot at a brighter future. 
So on reflection, I now realize there are only three things that I've always believed about child sexual abuse that I can say I still believe, only three. First, all of us have been affected by child sexual abuse. Some of us have been victims ourselves. Some of us are the parents or the siblings or the spouses or the friends of someone who has suffered abuse. Second thing I've always believed and still believe is that when terrible things happen to us or to the people we love, we hurt. And the pain never completely fades. The long-term effects of child sexual abuse we know can be devastating for not only children but their entire families. Experiencing sexual abuse can interfere with healthy development physically and socially and cognitively. And it can leave traces of traumatic injury. And third, the third thing I've always believed and I still believe is that whatever our own personal experiences might be, we all want to protect our children from sexual abuse. That's about it. That's about the sum total of what I've always believed about child sexual abuse that I can say that I still believe. Now, thanks to the work of the Moore Center and thanks to the work of lots of folks in this room, I've learned that many of the other things that I believed about sexual abuse of children are just plain wrong. And because we believe so many things that just aren't true, I've also learned that many of our responses to child sexual abuse are not only ineffective, but actually counterproductive. Perhaps because of our own experiences with child sexual abuse, hearing about sexual abuse can ignite feelings of anger and an urge to punish. Or perhaps we have such complicated feelings about sexuality. Or perhaps because we sometimes feel so powerless to protect our children from harm in today's scary society, I now believe we too often have turned to seemingly common sense but completely wrong-headed responses. Let me give just one example. I think if you ask the average person about child sexual abuse, they're likely to imagine a predatory serial offender, an adult who targets and stalks random children and then abducts them and does, and, and does terrible things to them. But we know from the data that children are much, much more likely to be abused by someone that they know, a relative, a neighbor, someone at their school, a volunteer in a program that they attend, etc. And we also know that half of child sexual abuse is, involves an adolescent with an average age of about 14, that adolescent engaging in inappropriate or illegal sexual behavior with a younger child, often a sibling or another child known to them. But rather than preventing those much more common situations of abuse, we tend to limit our prevention strategies to teaching children about stranger danger. And, and we become especially anxious if they go to some place that's new. And in the meantime, we too often fail to recognize the steps we could take to make them safer in their own homes, their schools, and in their communities. I think this overemphasis on stranger danger has led us to adopt policies and practices that I think are actually making children less safe rather than more. You know, it's as if we started out telling our children a scary story because we wanted them to be afraid enough to be protected so they'd be careful. And we made the story all about ruthless and pitiless monsters who were just waiting to catch them. And then we start to believe our own story and we start to search for monsters and we start to uh, enact laws to punish them when we, when we find them. And as a result, 
we deal with anyone who engages in any kind of inappropriate sexual behavior with a child, including children and youth themselves, children as young as 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, we treat them as the monsters that we've told our children about and we throw the book at them. And then we make a book about them, the sex offender registry and notification laws. We do this without a shred of evidence that requiring registration and notification for juveniles actually helps. Actually, with pretty good evidence, at least for youth, that it makes them vulnerable, vulnerable to becoming victims themselves, and it can leave them socially and emotionally isolated and thus more likely to offend. So the people in this room have dedicated their careers to finding and implementing more effective solutions, solutions that will help actually prevent child sexual abuse rather than merely react to it. So this morning, I wanted to talk a bit about the importance of translating the research that folks in this room are doing and the practice experience that others carry into fundamental changes in our public policy because I believe these changes are absolutely critical if we're going to truly protect our children and in fact if we're going to be, if we're going to be avoiding uh, more harm uh, than good. But first let me just say how honored I am to be included today in the company of so many people I, I respect. Uh, Steve and Julia, you've done something very, very important here and also something that is very rare. You've provided core support for the work of Elizabeth and her colleagues, but you've added your personal commitment, your engagement, and your investment. And I think that's going to make a huge difference for thousands and thousands and thousands of children and young people. And it's a contribution that I think will actually have lasting impact for generations to come. And in large measure, I believe that because you decided to fund the Moore Center here in a school of public health. And because the work of the Moore Center is grounded in the core values and perspectives of public health. I believe that addressing the problem of child sexual abuse from a public health perspective is absolutely critical to finding solutions that work. And to be clear, our current policies and our current practices are not grounded in a public health model, but rather in a punitive criminal justice model exclusively. Again, as Ron said, there's a role, of course, for the criminal justice system, but our current model relies exclusively on a criminal justice model, which focuses on individual pathology. And that approach is simply not working to protect our children. And again, in many cases, it's making things worse. So that's why I believe, Steve and Julia, you made exactly the right choice in investing in the Bloomberg School of Public Health and investing in Elizabeth and her team. The Moore Center is ideally positioned to bring together the science, the data, the practice, as well as the lived experience of those who have been touched by sexual abuse, and to help create more effective and more far-reaching prevention strategies in the tradition of public health. Now, as I think I've already made very clear, I am not an expert on child sexual abuse, nor am I a researcher in the field. But the evidence and the data that folks in this room have pulled together help to point to several ways in which our current approaches are wrong-headed. Let me just cover a few. Because public policy is based on the fundamental belief that offenders can't change, all the intervention focuses on removing them from society, either through incarceration or through near total isolation in their choices in housing, employment, and social interaction. At the same time, our limited prevention efforts are focused on changing the behavior of potential victims, which again seems to make common sense at one level, but if a child is 
abused, it runs the risk of implying that it was their fault or their family's fault for not doing these things they should have done, thereby running the risk of re-victimizing children who are abused because they received this message that it was their fault. Another example, public policy almost exclusive, uh, focuses almost exclusively on predicting and controlling individual behavior in the mistaken belief that we can somehow know ahead of time who might engage in harmful or illegal sexual behavior. And that such people are so obviously, monstrously pathological and evil that we can recognize them. So we use discredited technologies like lie detectors and plethysmographs and various risk assessment instruments with precious little reliability or, or validity rather than building in the supports and the common sense protection for community, uh, the common sense protection into community organizations and schools and recognizing that many times sexual abuse in fact is situational and context specific. Another example, public policy today continues to treat children or youth who have engaged in harmful or illegal sexual behavior as deeply and permanently pathological, requiring lifelong monitoring and coercive treatment. Yet we know from the research that many of the behaviors that they have engaged in represent child and adolescent experimentation and exploration that goes off track, which is clearly truly harmful, but preventable. Our public policy relies on juvenile sex offender registry and notification in an attempt to control and punish even one-time offenders, yet the latest research that's starting to come out points to increased likelihood that young people who are on such registries will themselves experience sexual abuse as well as having increased risk of serious social and mental health consequences including suicide risk. Our public policy assumes that anyone sexually attracted to a young child is a sociopath with no empathy or concern for victims and no interest in controlling their behavior. Elizabeth and her team are engaged in groundbreaking work that challenges that assumption, that documents the desperate search for help among young people who find themselves sexually attractive to, attracted to younger children. And yet, given our public policy, those young people who are looking for help risk not only stigma, but potentially arrest and isolation if they seek out that help. And finally, public policy is based on an assumption of very high recidivism rates among juvenile offenders. Another example of something that I always believe to be true. And that therefore they should be feared or punished or shunned and permanently set aside. And yet the data tell us that fewer than 5% of these young people re-offend, raising the fundamental and critical question whether smart programs grounded in public health principles could have prevented the abuse in the first place. So that takes me to the need for public policy advocacy. I think these examples show, show how far we have to go before the insights of science and evidence find their way into policy and into practice. But that hard work of building evidence and data-informed understanding that many folks in this room have been engaged in is only going to be reflected in public policy if it's understood by policymakers and only if it is translated into smarter, more effective, and less harmful policy and practice. Now I want to share a very quick story about another field that I think has some parallels to where we are today in the field of child sexual abuse. About 25 years ago, there were so-called scientific predictions of a huge increase in violent crime among young people. Coming out of the crack epidemic, several folks gained a lot of attention by predicting a horde of super predators. This is what was the name that was used 
that would be descending upon communities. And it will be no surprise that the face of these super predators were almost routinely African American young people as the face of the coming horde of super predators. The result is to feed in, was to feed into this notion of beginning, of becoming much tougher on crime, including policies that led to mass incarceration, the use of boot camps as a so-called common sense approach to whip young kids into shape, putting in place zero tolerance rules that have resulted in criminalizing normative adolescent behavior. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but perhaps we can reflect upon our own youth and imagine if we were a young person today, how many times we did something that potentially could have been seen today as criminal behavior. The results of this movement were huge expenditures in financial cost, huge human costs, huge uh, failure, uh, abuse in these institutions that we were sending our young people. It was a disaster. This began 25 years ago. Now over time, data and the science began to catch up on what we know about juvenile delinquency. The data showed that contrary to all the predictions, violent crime began to drop precipitously the exact opposite of what was predicted. We also had data that showed terrible recidivism rates. For those young people who were locked up, the odds of reoffending were 60, 70, 80 percent, and that remains true today. At the same time, advances in science revealed much more about the human brain and how it develops and when it develops and the fact that it is during adolescent and young adulthood that impulse control, judgment, planning for the future, empathy, all those basic functions begin to become more and more prominent. And so it's not surprising that before all these uh, functions have developed that young people do wrong-headed and sometimes terrible things. And finally, uh, the science moved forward in identifying more effective interventions, more effective than locking kids up interventions that were community-based and family-based. Now, 25 years ago, as the super predator um, myth began to take hold, the Casey Foundation, in the teeth of that, decided to start something called the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, JDAI, although some people call it JEDI. Eh. <laughs> the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative. And, and we were out to demonstrate that we could protect public safety and still reduce the number of kids locked up in detention. This was a demonstration model started with five sites. I will tell you that two of them worked out pretty well. One was like, eh, and two were like failures. And most foundations, after five years, would say, well, we, we tried, we're done, on to the next thing. That's not what we did. Instead, in addition to modifying the model, learning from what we, learn, learning from what we did in the first uh, few years, uh, we began to find other places and to replicate, but we also began to work on public policy. We built coalitions of advocates. We reached out to not just judges, but also prosecutors and public defenders, administrators of these systems, governor's offices, legislators, youth and family themselves. And we worked over the last 25 years to change the trajectory of detention in this country. Today, Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative is in 300 jurisdictions. We've seen a 43% reduction in youth detention in the places in which we've worked, and we've seen a 40% drop in crime in the places in which we've worked. I tell you that story because the ideas about young people in the early to mid-90s, this notion of super predators, Many of, much of which still continue to this day, is what drove completely wrong-headed public policy that did more harm than good. It turned out that if you didn't incarcerate a kid, he was less likely to commit another crime and much more likely to be on a path towards success. I think there's a lot of relevance from that experience to what you all are trying to do today. So because of the experience of the foundation in working in the policy arena, I sometimes get asked for advice on how to set up 
a policy advocacy operation where I'll get asked, you know, how do we go about changing policy? Now, it's important to say I don't have any uh, magic answers to that question, but I do honor the advice of the Cheshire Cat when Alice asked which road she should take, and he asked her, well, where do you want to go? And she said, I don't know. And so he said, then it doesn't really matter what road you take. So I would suggest the first place to start is being very clear on what you're trying to accomplish. So I'm going to take a crack at least at what I would suggest is an agenda for public policy goals in the field of child sexual abuse in hopes that it will generate conversation. My vote would be on two related priorities. I'm going to talk about each briefly. First, the first pri priority would be to reverse public policies that send us down the wrong road. Think of the Cheshire Cat. We want to reverse things that lead us to react after abuse has occurred and react in a way that make things worse. And the second priority, public policy priority, would be to increase public investment in developing prevention strategies that work. So on the first priority, what I would start with is pushing to change the laws that require placing juveniles on the sex offender registry. Thanks largely to Elizabeth and several colleagues who are again here in this room today as well as around the country and the work of the Moore Center, this in fact is a policy goal within our reach. This is possible. This is doable. To support that work, I'm pleased to announce that the Casey Foundation will make a one-time grant of $100,000 to support the Moore Center's efforts to reform this country's juvenile sex offender registry. We should also go on to eliminate other things that we know are at best ineffective but also might do harm. For example, indiscriminately sentencing people who have engaged in illegal sexual behavior to open-ended commitments to locked programs, including sentencing young people to such programs. Other things like lifelong registry, again, for young people and others. The reliance on lie detectors and plethysmographs used as part of so-called treatment. These are all things that take us down the wrong road, and we ought to move in public policy to stop them. On the second priority, we need to convince policymakers to invest in finding more effective approaches to prevention. Given the harm caused by child sexual abuse and the resulting human misery, it's time we invested serious financial and human resources in developing effective prevention efforts based on the insights of public health. We need to focus on developing, testing, and refining prevention programs that are both systemic, and by that I mean helping schools and community groups learn how to ensure safe spaces for children, but we also need to focus on programs that focus on those who are at risk of inappropriate or illegal sexual behavior with children. Whether they are at risk because of some specific context or situation they find themselves in, or because they are still developing emotionally, socially, and sexually, young people, or because they admit and will speak up about being attracted to young children as part of their psychosexual makeup which means we need to stop seeing people at risk due to any of these circumstances as monsters, but rather help them avoid triggers and decrease the odds that they will engage in behavior that harms children. Obviously, developing effective prevention strategies is going to take money and the will to invest in growing the science and paying for the research and the evaluation, and it's going to take many years. This doesn't happen quickly. Now the generosity of individual donors like Steve and Julia is absolutely critical and that can help support the infrastructure in institutions such as the Moore Center, but that's not going to get us there. We need public policymakers who are willing to invest public funds 
in solving this public health problem because that's the scale of investment that we need. So if that's where we want to go, reversing public policies that don't work and do harm and convincing uh, policymakers to increase investment in finding more effective approaches, here are five, I promise, quick things I've learned uh, that might be relevant about how to go about affecting uh, public policy. You'll have your own list. This is mine. First, rather than uh, a broad or unfocused campaign to try to change overall public opinion in a kind of broad way, I would urge a focus directly on reaching and convincing two groups. One, the policy makers and policy implementers themselves, by which I mean reaching directly judges, legislators, governors, leaders of faith organizations, heads of large child and youth serving organizations, etc. I should have been reached in the various roles that I played over my career. I was never reached. And the second group that I would argue we should try to reach directly are the people who influence those other people the folks who are the key messengers, who can be the champions, and who already have relationships with these policymakers. Perhaps the most important lesson in politics and policy is that relationships matter. The immense power of personal relationships and credible messengers willing to champion your cause. And those relationships take time to build. It's a lot easier to reach folks who already have those relationships and then build on that. That's the first bit of advice. Second, obviously research and data matter. In fact, they are critical. But we need to link the research and the data evidence to personal experience and powerful stories. And so I would urge that we invest in doing messaging research. What are the words that work? What are the stories that won't take us down the wrong path? And the good news, here, good news is there's a lot to build on. For example, in juvenile justice messaging, there's a lot of uh, messaging uh, research available that could inform how one would proceed. Third, I would urge that we not invest huge amounts in creating standalone advocacy capacity. Rather, I would urge that we build on existing messaging and advocacy platforms. To do that, it means you have to create partnerships. You have to create coalitions, including and especially with advocates for victims. It means you have to form relationships with what I think of as field-leading organizations that already exist. I mean, an obvious one is the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, and the Moore Center is already uh, very much involved there. But I would add the National Conference of State Legislators, the National Governors Association, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, the National Juvenile Defenders Association, and so on and so on. These are the organizations that have the people that you're trying to reach, form partnerships with them, get to know what they do, get, to, get them to know what you do. I have a concept I call gear organization. What I mean by that, if you can get to that organization and move it, a lot of other gears change. So examples, the national offices of the large uh, uh, child serving organizations, like the National Office of the Boys and Girls Club and the WISE and Catholic Charities, they all have affiliates all over the country. Partnering with them will drive, they're a gear that drives, in some cases, literally thousands of community-based organizations. And then you cannot leave out what I call the unlikely allies. And what I mean by the unlikely allies are people who you might think, well, they're not going to agree with me, so I'm not going to have a relationship with them. Great mistake. You want them in the tent, not outside the tent. I won't complete Lyndon Johnson's description of that, but you want them in the tent. And the point is that you have to not only make uh, close relationships with advocates for victims, which is critical and it just, it's justice, one should do that, 
but also there are organizations like Right on Crime that represent uh, folks more from the um, right side of the political spectrum. Uh, there are libertarian groups who are very interested in getting involved in these kinds of issues. Um, there are groups of evangelicals, especially young ev evangelicals, who are committed to social justice. So I would make a list of the unlikely allies who are going to be more powerful than you in reaching certain policymakers. So you can have a megaphone, but if they've got a microphone with a big amplifier, you want their amplifier. So you've got to have a relationship with them. Fourth, try to be both strategic but also opportunistic. By working strategically, I mean take this time to create these relationships, build the partnerships, get clear on the big picture of what you want to accomplish, lay out your plans. This is how we all go about the work. But what folks often don't recognize until they're in the midst is that at least in the US, I don't know about Canada, Ron, but at least in the US, public policy moves in what's called disjointed incrementalism. What that means is it's like a, you nudge forward. Now, once in a while, something big happens. I mean, I understand a lot of big stuff's going to happen this week. But usually, it's like a nudge forward, right? Because of that, opportunities arise that you didn't see coming. So you've got to be nimble, and you've got to be prepared when an opportunity is there to move your agenda forward, even if it's kind of off track from your big grand plan with this month, this is going to happen, next month, that's going to happen. And you know where you find those opportunities? Through the relationships I was talking about earlier. When somebody, a congressional staff person, for example, gives you a call and say, hey, they're marking up this bill, and there's an opportunity to put something in there. Finally, last bit of advice that shouldn't need to be said, but I'll say it anyway, data and facts do matter. Evidence matters. Stories can bring the data and evidence to life, but policy by anecdote leads to bad policy. Your work, your collective work, and the work of the Moore Center to bring science and data to bear to prevent the harm of child sexual abuse is more important than ever. No child, no parent, no grandparent, no caregiver should have to experience the wrenching trauma of sexual abuse. It's time we got smarter about how to prevent it. And your work and your commitment and your passion for protecting children are what gives me confidence that we will get smarter and millions of children will have a brighter future as a result. Thank you.